In this section, we're going to be looking at uh, solids and how intermolecular forces can influence that type of um, attractive force. And the first thing we want to look at is ionic solids and how do they dissolve, how do they conduct. Most of the time when you have a ionic compound and you dissolve it in a polar solvent like water, it will conduct electricity. And that's because it has the ability to transfer electrons between the ions and the water. Now, the more salt you put in the solution, the higher the conductivity. We could actually measure the amount of conductivity um, and that will tell us how much salt is actually dissolved. Now, <clears throat> please remember that ionic compounds, they have a very high attractive force within that bond. Please remember this is an intramolecular force and it's all due to the fact that there's coulombic forces of attraction. So the positive ions are attracted to the negative anions. And as a result of it, we have a very high melting point. Um, please remember that ionic compounds have a stronger attraction, therefore they have a higher melting point. They're also very hard and they have low volatility, volatility which means that most of the elements are in the solid form as opposed to the gas form. Now, the reason why we see the properties that we do with solid ionic compounds is that when you hit them, um, they become brittle. And as a result of it, there's repulsion in this um, middle box here where you see the negatively charged anions start pushing away from each other. And as a result, you get a breakage. Now, please remember, even though there's metals in here, the combination of the metal with the nonmetal makes it not malleable, or ductile means pulling it into a wire. You cannot turn ionic compounds into wires. Okay, so molecular, now we're talking about covalent bonds. And it's important to remember that most molecular solids will not conduct electricity especially when they are melted or dissolved in water. So the reason why is they're a neutral molecule. They have no net charge and their electrons are not being transferred over to different uh, molecules. So as a result, um, you're not going to have conductivity. However, um, if you do have an acid, you could have conductivity because ions typically do get formed or ionized as a result of it. Now when you're talking about a molecular solid, they are typically being held by intermolecular forces and those intermolecular forces are weaker. It is not like an ionic solid. So they're not going to have the same um, melting points that ionic compounds will have. They will have a higher vapor pressure because their attractive force holding them together is not as strong. So you'll have more gas molecules above the solid. Therefore, there'll be a lower melting point. There'll also be a lower boiling point as a result of it. Okay, so we talked about this in the previous section where we were looking at um, saturated versus unsaturated. So because we have a stronger <clears throat> attraction, because the saturated fat is more of a linear structure, it's, it's less bent. The unsaturated is bent, so the saturated fat is going to be solid, whereas the unsaturated is going to be a liquid. So please remember that when we're talking about molecular solids, they have intermolecular forces, so it's not like ionic compound. Um, they do line up and they're more attractive, but as, as a result, we have a lower melting point. Okay, so here is a heating curve. And what this just means is that if you go from left to right, you're adding heat. So at the very bottom corner here, we're talking about solid. Usually when we show curves like this, it tends to be things like water. So we're talking about ice. Um, notice that temperature changes when you have one phase, so you just have the solid form. 
the moment you have a combination of solid and liquid, temperature no longer changes, and that's because you have a change in phase. So as a result of it, when you see horizontal lines, that's showing a phase change. So notice that heat of fusion, its um, amount of energy is going to be a certain amount to convert all of the solid into pure liquid. And that's why we see no temperature change because of that change. Once again, when we go up in temperature, we're in just one phase. And when we have a combination of liquid and gas, now we're talking about a phase change. So we're changing from a liquid to a gas, and it's horizontal because all that energy is being converted from a liquid to a, a gas. Now the reason why we have these horizontal parts is because we have to put energy into the system to remove or separate the molecules away from each other. So we're trying to get rid of the attractive forces. So whenever you have a phase change, you're putting energy into the system to remove that attractive force. Um, just to keep you aware that heat of fusion um, you're putting energy into the system, so we're talking about a positive value. So notice that melting is an endothermic process. Now you could argue that if you have freezing, which is the opposite, you would have an exothermic process. Okay, so when we're talking about ionic compounds, um, the heat of fusion for ionic compounds has to be very large because you're trying to break the forces that a sodium ion might be attracted to a chlorine ion. So as a result, there's a huge energy um, requirement to separate those compounds. And that also explains why we have very high melting and boiling points for ionic compounds. Now for uh, covalent liquids, okay, um, Going from a solid to a liquid, there is an energy requirement. Um, when you are in the liquid phase, you could argue that um, the attractive forces aren't as great. So solid forces, intermolecular forces, are higher than liquid intermolecular forces. So the energy requirement um, should be different. Now, vaporization, it takes a lot of energy to go from a liquid to a gas. And the reason why is you're trying to separate out the molecules even more. Now, once again, going from a liquid to a gas, we're requiring energy. So the value is going to be positive. And um, as you are trying to separate out the different molecules, there is a huge energy requirement. By the way, just to let you know, um, if you ever came in contact with steam, steam, which is a vapor of water, has a huge amount of energy in it. So a liquid um, energy is not as high as a vapor energy. And as a result of it, if you come in contact with steam, um, if you got a burn from steam, it would be awful. Okay, let's talk about vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is essentially molecules that have entered the gas phase. And as a result of it, they tend to ho hover over a liquid and they exert a pressure on top of the liquid. So if you had a glass of water, some of those water molecules would be leaving the liquid phase because there was energy put into the system and as a result of it they are hovering over the liquid water and they're exerting a pressure. Now the rate of this transformation uh, depends on the surface area so obviously more surface area the more vapor pressure you're going to have. The other thing is temperature. If you increase the temperature of a liquid you're going to have a higher vapor pressure because you're giving that liquid energy to help separate the attractive forces and allow the molecules to become a gas. 
Now, boiling, what is boiling? Boiling is where you have a equalization or equilibrization where you have the atmospheric pressure equal to the vapor pressure of that liquid. So um, please remember that when we're talking about the vapor pressure of the liquid, it has to equal the atmospheric pressure. So guess what? Boiling happens at different temperatures all around the world based on the atmospheric pressure. Now, if you want to think about what's going on with boiling, there are bubbles. Now, you have to be careful because just because you see bubbles in water doesn't mean that boiling is taking place. Lots of times it's just gas that is dissolved within the water. So you actually have to see vigorous bubbles forming. And these bubbles are actually water vapor. So water vapor starts to form inside the liquid. And as a result of it, it is pushing out in this bubble. And eventually it will rise because of the density of that bubble. And you'll see it coming to the top. Now notice in this chart here, sea level, notice what happens to boiling point when you change elevation. So this is something that people really struggle with. Going up in elevation does not increase boiling point. It does the opposite thing. So notice how Mount Everest, um, I know I've had this question in the past, if you wanted to make chicken soup on Everest, would you want to eat that chicken? Uh, probably not because it would not be fully cooked. So um, they have to adjust things like use pressure cookers to help cause the boiling point to increase at higher ele elevation. So notice that the lower you are, the higher the boiling point, the higher you are, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. The lower you are, the higher the boiling point, the higher elevation you are, the lower the boiling point. Okay, now um, if you have different liquids, and this is something that you have to get very comfortable with, the higher the boiling point, the higher the intermolecular force. So if you have something that has a very high boiling point, maybe it's higher than water, that must mean that the attractive forces for that liquid are very strong. So what happens is boiling point is an indicator of strength because you have to put in a higher amount of energy to cause that liquid to go to the gas state. So um, if you're looking at vapor pressure, that is also an indicator of whether or not you have um, attractive forces. So please remember, if you have a high amount of vapor pressure that's above a liquid, it probably means the attractive forces are weaker. The lower the vapor pressure, that must mean it, it has a very high intermolecular force. So here we have some examples, and they've uh, been nice enough to give us some boiling points to help us see what's going on here. So water, water as a result here has a very high boiling point. And notice that the amount of energy that it takes to vaporize water is pretty high. Whereas the opposite here with argon, it has a very low boiling point. And notice that the amount of energy that it takes to vaporize that, that atom is pretty small when you compare it to water. So if you look at the heat of vaporization, that's the amount of energy it takes to break those attractive forces. If that is tiny, that is telling you that it probably is a very weak intermolecular force. And notice argon is just dispersion, whereas water is a combination of hydrogen bonds and London dispersion forces. So that's another indicator why it has such a high boiling point. Okay, sublimation. So you should know what sublimation is. And please remember, sublimation doesn't happen with everything. Um, dry ice is one of those things that we're very familiar with where it skips a phase it can go straight to a gas from the solid. And this is all because it has weak intermolecular forces. And dry ice is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule, so its attractive force is going to be only London dispersion forces. And that's partially why it has um, 
a very easy pathway to be um, going from a solid to a gas. Now ionic solids, and I talked about this a couple slides ago, if you have a very strong attractive force, you're going to have low vapor pressure. So you're going to have very little molecules that are actually hovering over the solid. And that is very true of ionic solids, and that's because it has strong coulombic forces of attraction because the cations and the anions um, are very strongly attracted with each other. Now another example of a solid is covalent network. Um, so these are nonmetals, and they are very good at forming these covalent bonds that stretch on for many, many atoms. So as a result of it, um, it's a very strongly attracted solid. Usually carbon is a good example of this. Diamond. Okay, the reason why diamond is so valuable is it's a very strong covalent network solid. Um, if you are familiar with industry, a lot of um, drilling takes place with diamond drill bits because diamond is a good solid that they can use to help break through a lot of material. Um, notice that these covalent network solids have very high melting points. They're extremely hard and they have fixed bond angles. So they're not like a liquid where they're floating around. Also, well, I already said that, but if you look at the bottom there, there's the high melting point of diamond. Okay, so here is another example, which is graphite. Graphite is an allotrope of diamond. So they're both made with carbon. Um, notice that it's hexag a hexagon shape and it is interconnected with more than one carbon and that's probably a huge difference in its strength. So notice that one carbon is actually attached to three different carbons and as a result of it that is a strengthening uh, piece for that solid. And I don't know how familiar you are with graphite but um, people have shown that you can make sheets of graphite, and these sheets have pretty amazing properties. Um, you could actually conduct electricity with graphite. I don't know how familiar you're with that. Um, we could actually take a pencil and turn that into um, electrochemical process. And that's all because of the pi bonds or the electrons that can be shared within those uh, carbons. Okay, so they're just showing you an example of pi bonds. Um, pi bonds are part of the p orbital system of carbon. Um, they technically are not, there's no double bond in this situation, but because they are stacked one on top of the other, the underlying or overlying carbons have access to their p orbitals where the electrons can flow. And that's why um, it has the qualities that it has. Another example of covalent network solid is silica or quartz. Um, notice that it is Si2, so those are two nonmetals that are covalently bonded together. And they are similar to graphite where they're very good at sharing their electrons. And as a result of it, also they're bonded to more than one atom. So this makes them very um, sturdy and high melting point. Also, you could argue silicon by itself and sil silicon um, carbide is another example of a covalent network solid. Okay, I'm going to gloss over these. Okay, um, here are examples of some polymers that you might see. Um, please remember, carbon and hydrogen are very good at sharing their electrons within a covalent bond, and as a result of it, there's um, no polar bond. So as a result of that, this is a nonpolar molecule. Now, if it's a long chain, long chains are very good at being attracted to each other. It's sort of like Velcro. They kind of lay on top of each other, and they're 
they're attracted to their proximity and that's what makes them have maybe a higher boiling point. Also, they can be very um, viscous. You may notice that they describe them as slow flowing. So it's almost like molasses or honey. Um, that helps them have the certain properties that they have. So even though they're London dispersion forces, the attractive forces are high enough to have these kind of properties. Okay, metallic solids. Now this is another type of intramolecular force. Um, so it's not a covalent force. It's not a ionic force. Um, what happens is you have positively charged metals that are very good at letting their electrons flow from metal to metal nuclei. So here's an example of sodium. Sodium is an alkali metal, has a melting point of 97.5. Iron, which is a transition metal, it has a much higher melting point. And the reason why is they essentially use this sea of electrons to help them have certain properties. So iron is really good at conducting electricity. It's also very good at conducting heat. So you have a lot of um, cookware that is good for um, conducting heat. Also, it is malleable, so you can hammer it. You can pull it into a wire. And um, as a result of it, it will not break apart. And that's partially why it has the strength that it has and the reason why it has the very high melting point. Now, um, in addition to just metals by themselves, we have what we call alloys. So alloys are taking the property of two different elements and combining them and changing it into a new property. So steel is actually iron with carbon. And what carbon does is it helps make it more um, resistant to change in shape. Also, um, Notice it is filling in the spaces between carbon. So um, it's allowing for its structure to be strengthened, but yet retain some of the conductivity that it still has. Brass is another alloy. So the interesting thing with brass, and this is a substitutional. So the, the other one was interstitial, where you're putting in little elements to help strengthen up the overall metal. Here we have two metals and they just happen to have the same size. If you look at a periodic table you'll notice that copper and zinc are close to each other so as a result of it their radius is very close. So if you took copper and you heated it up and you had put some zinc on the outside of that copper the zinc will find a way to swap with some of the copper so that you get brass forming and as a result of it, it has a new quality to it. It has a different color, it has a different strength. It still retains its properties of being malleable and ductile, and it also retains its property of conducting electricity. Now notice at the bottom there, they say when you have a substitutional alloy, the density will be a average of those um, two separate metals.